Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. All right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Plocrococcus. And um, I'll say that Plocrococcus is probably the most important organism that you never heard about. Uh, it's a uh, marine cyanobacteria. Uh, and here's a EM picture of it. So it lives by photosynthesis, meaning that it just fixes CO2. And other than that, all it needs is maybe nitrate, phosphate, and a few uh, metals like iron. It's the smallest known photosynthetic organism on the planet. It's probably also the most abundant uh, photosynthetic organism on the planet. And it's probably also the single organism that most contributes to fixing CO2 on the planet. So it has a tremendous impact on sort of global um, issues around carbon cycling, nutrient cycling, et cetera. And of course, uh, in the ocean, it, it plays a really key role. Uh, if you think about where to find Plocrococcus, uh, there's 10 to the 27 uh, cells on the planet. So there's a good chance that you'll find it in many places in the ocean. But it does dominate uh, low latitude regions where it's warm, typically rather warm indeed, and also uh, low nutrient environments. Uh, the tropics and subtropics uh, oceans tend to be characterized by low nutrients. Also, uh, a key point for this talk is that uh, Plocrococcus as a group, uh, all of the different organisms within what we call Plocrococcus is more than 97% uh, similar in the 16S uh, ribosome line A uh, sequence. So in, in many sort of uh, common microbial ecology assays where we're looking at 16S, we we'll basically lump this into one OTU or one group. And so I'll try to uh, talk to you today about that there's a lot of diversity within this group that really tells us a lot about both how organisms evolve, what is their ecological role, and how do they sort of contribute to uh, global uh, cycles. All right. Let me cover everything here. Okay, so uh, as I said, this is a, a heat map of where we find Plocrococcus. And as you can see that they're very dominant in low latitude regions. And then around 40 south, 40 north, uh, they start to trail off. They're also predicted as the oceans heat up, as you saw in the movie. Uh, maybe I'll play it one more time. Is that uh, they're predicted to increase uh, quite substantially in a future uh, warmer ocean. So even though there's a lot of Plocrococcus cells uh, today, there's in all likelihood going to be a lot more uh, in the future. We can also see that uh, Plocrococcus is found in, in vast regions of the ocean, uh, both uh, sort of down here, sort of towards uh, the temperate uh, uh, regions. And these regions are uh, characterized, or anyway, I should start here in the middle. So uh, the uh, most common environment where we find Plocrococcus is in the tropics, and this is where it's hot and uh, there are low nutrients. That is their primary habitat. But as you can see in the map, we also start to see them towards uh, into the temperate zones. And this is uh, regions that are uh, much cooler. And also in these regions, uh, the nutrient levels, like nitrate and phosphate, also are somewhat higher than they are in the tropics. Another um, a third biome where we tend to find uh, Plocrococcus are these what we call uh, eastern uh, boundary currents. These are regions where water rises from the deep uh, into the surface. So they tend to have uh, a lot of nutrients. However, there's very little iron, as we heard about in one of the earlier talks uh, this morning, that iron can often be a limiting uh, nutrient for organisms. And many uh, photosynthetic organisms, phytoplankton, that lives in these environments are thought to be uh, iron limited. So these are the three main habitats in where we find Plocrococcus. So the hot, uh, low nutrient environments, sort of the cooler with some nutrient environments, and then this sort of weird, sort of uh, hottish environment, but with low iron. All right, if we go in and look in detail at the physiology of, uh, of this group of Plocrococcus that are all uh, quite closely related strains, we find that we can uh, divide Plocrococcus into two major groups. There's one group uh, where uh, organisms are adapted to high level, high light levels, 
like what you would see in the surface of the water column. And then there's a group of Plocarcarcus that we see down here, which is adapted to uh, low light uh, levels, what you typically would find uh, lower in the water column as the light gets filtered, as it's penetrating the water. And so if you go out in field surveys, uh, this is depth going from, about, from the surface down to about 90 meters. We can see that the uh, genotypes that are highlight adapted, those are the ones that we find in high abundance near the surface. And the genotypes that are uh, low light adapted, those are the ones that we find uh, lower in the water column. If we dive, uh, and we tend to call them highlight and low light adapted, for that sake. If we dive further into the phylogenetic tree of Plocorococcus, we can now subdivide uh, the highlight adapted types into two major groups. And this was work that was primarily driven by a collaboration with JCBI, where we did a lot of uh, metagenomics uh, to try to understand the physiology. And what we identified that there was this uh, one group here that are uh, specifically adapted to uh, low iron levels, whereas the rest of the highlight types are adapted to high iron. If we take another dive, one further level down, we can now divide the high iron adapted group into two uh, major clades. This is uh, the one we call the high temperature adapted clade, and we have this uh, low temperature adapted clade. And so we basically have three major ecotypes uh, associated with the high light uh, environment. We have the one that we call HNLC. These are the ones we find in low iron. We have a group that we find in sort of colder waters. This one we call highlight one. And then we have the one that's found in highlight high iron, high temperature, and this one we call highlight two. <clears throat> Over uh, the last five years or so, uh, my lab has undertaken a series of oceanographic uh, cruises uh, to different places in the world to look at what is the distribution of the diversity of these different groups. And here you see uh, some of the cruises on the cruise map. All right, and uh, in general, this is the way we sample. It's a lot of hard work. We use this reset. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of it from Dave Valentine's uh, work before, but we basically uh, drop that into the water. And then at different depths, we can fill water in each of these bottles. And then we filter it uh, on the surface. This, uh, this you basically do around the clock. And uh, it can be uh, interesting when hurricanes are passing through. But then there are other times where uh, it might be a little more uh, relaxing. Uh, in between uh, stations. So uh, the cruises I'm going to talk about basically covers these three types of biomes for which we find Plocorococcus. We have sort of the, the higher latitude, colder, more nutrient replete environment. We have the one in the middle, which is hot with low nutrients. And then we have down towards the equator, we have this sort of low iron type environment. And so at all these places, we uh, sampled uh, the DNA, both at the surface, but also at depth and uh, collected about uh, 300 samples or so. And uh, used the marker gene to understand the phylogenetic diversity at all these sites. So what you see here is basically latitude going from the equator all the way up to 55 north. And what we can see here is that this highlight one, this is the one that is adapted to uh, lower temperatures uh, but elevated nutrients. And we find that right at the edge of uh, where we would find Plocorcarcus. And this is indeed where we see uh, the coldest waters. And here we then see this is the highlight two. This is the one that's adapted to uh, low nutrients but high temperature. And we can see it basically go from about five degrees north all the way up to about 40 north. And this is indeed sort of the region that is uh, elevated in temperature but has uh, vanishingly low uh, nutrient levels. And then finally, we find that near the uh, equator, is where we find this HNLC group, and this is where there's some nu uh, nutrients like nitrate and phosphate, but there's barely any iron, and this is where that group uh, proliferates. So based on sort of our understanding of both the field distribution and the distribution of uh, phylogenetic traits, uh, of traits in Plocorcarcus, we have sort of this, what I think of the Matryoshka model for uh, uh, the distribution of traits in uh, Plocorcarcus. At sort of the broadest level, uh, Plocorcarcus is a really small cell uh, and uh, much smaller than uh, the neighboring phylogenetic groups. 
within that, right, we show uh, that it basically uh, can divide it into uh, high light and low light adapted. Further within the light, we divide it into high and low iron adapted. And further within the iron, we can divide it into high and low temperature. But what about the rest, right? So uh, what is the functioning and uh, distribution of uh, the diversity of the types that we find within these groups that are defined by light, uh, iron, or temperature adaptation? What we can sort of think about as uh, microdiversity at a really fine scale level of uh, phylogenetic uh, differentiation. If we sequence the genomes of Plocarococcus, we'll see that uh, there's a tremendous number of different genes. Uh, this is an uh, old work uh, now, about 10 years old, and just from sequencing 12 genomes, we have about 6,000 unique genes uh, found in Plocarococcus, what you can think of as the pan-genome. Nowadays, there might be 60 uh, genomes of Plocarococcus, and I think uh, it's predicted to have more than 100,000 unique genes uh, within that group. So there's clearly a lot of genetic and genomic differentiation among uh, all these different Plocarococcus uh, lineages. And so what is the role of that? So today, I'll just uh, uh, give one uh, vignette about uh, how we try to uh, really deep into these fine scale levels and understand uh, what is it that differentiates uh, these lineages. So uh, <clears throat> what feels really arcane today uh, we did this microarray experiment uh, about 12 years ago, and what we were interested in was to understand what genes are upregulated under uh, phosphate, str phosphate stress. So basically when they're growing at really low phosphate. And we used one strain, which is called MET4. And what we found was that all the genes that get upregulated under phosphate stress are more or less found in this one operon, sort of super operon, of uh, in Plocarcoccus, it's sort of one genome region. And within that, we find genes associated with uh, stress regulation, so two component uh, regulatory systems, uh, systems involved in uptake of phosphorus, as well as uh, enzymes that are involved in sort of cleaving phosphate off organic molecules. These were all up, uh, found in this one region, and they were all upregulated when Plocarcoccus uh, was stressed by phosphorus. Now, we had sequenced uh, a bunch of genomes by that time, and so when we compared this genome region to other strains of Plocarcoccus and put them on a phylogenetic uh, tree, we found that even very closely related strains of Plocarcoccus had vastly different uh, genes associated with phosphorus uptake and regulation. So these two strains are uh, nearly identical, I think, except for one base pair in the 16S ribosomal RNA. But Despite that, the uh, large differences in the genomic complement of what genes they have associated with phosphorus acquisition. So one, MET4, has 25 genes associated with that, and the other one only has five, and the rest are uh, clearly lost from the genome. If we go into the other group, this is the high temperature, low nutrient adapted clade. There again, we see the same pattern. Some strains have most of these genes involved in phosphorus uptake, whereas other strains, they're all gone. And so there's a high variability in which, in, uh, among very closely related strains of Plocarcoccus in terms of which genes they have for acquiring phosphorus. So the trait, meaning being able to grow under low phosphorus, shows a lot of variability uh, within uh, Plocarcoccus. And so it's clearly associated with these really fine scale clades, something that you would never pick up if you were ana only analyzing the 16S ribosomal RNA genes. So if we zoom in on each of these sort of major clades, sort of magnifies up, there's basically a lot of different sort of uh, microdiverse groupings uh, within e each of these uh, clades of Plocarcoccus. And so what is the function of that? Well, we just saw that uh, nutrient acquisition was one that was highly variable among these groups. Also, uh, resistance to predators like viruses and eukaryotes. This is seen in Plocarcoccus, but a similar pattern is seen in a lot of different other organisms uh, uh, following uh, some of this work. So how do we assess and understand the distribution of this microdiversity and link it back to uh, the functioning of Plocarcoccus? 
Well, clearly, the analysis of 16S masked this diversity. It will basically just all look like the same fragment, or at least within sequencing error, it would look like the same everywhere. So we need uh, marker genes for understanding the distribution of diversity that is much more variable than 16S ribosomal RNA. In many ways, for a lot of microbiological studies, 16S ribosomal RNA is a terrible marker. It was picked as a very conserved marker to really understand deep evolution, but a lot of microbial differentiation occurs at a much finer scale re resolution where you cannot use 16S uh, ribosomal RNA to distinguish these groups. The other problem is that when you're looking at just a few base pairs differences, PCR and sequencing errors will basically mask and make it very hard to tease out a coherent signal. So we also need bioinformatics tools to sort of uh, be able to adjust for, for these types of errors. And finally, uh, sequence alignments are very computationally expensive. And so uh, it makes it very difficult when you get millions and millions of reads to align them properly. And so uh, one option to do that is to find target regions for your marker genes where there's no insertions and deletions which makes it both much more robust to compare sequences and also computationally tremendously more cheap. And so uh, to deal with that, uh, we, are, we shifted to use a, a protein sequence because the nice thing about the protein sequence is that you have the third codon variability. So immediately you get much more sequence variation even among organisms that have the same protein. So the protein level, they might be the same, but on the nucleotide level you start to get much more variation which allows you to differentiate in a much finer scale in the evolutionary history of organisms. And we're using this RNA polymerase, which is a very conserved at the amino acid level, but not so much on the nucleotide level to distinguish these, uh, this type of microdiversity. So here's an example where when we uh, sequence uh, Plocrococcus in, uh, in the water column, so five meters apart, and then we're looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, to uh, figure out uh, what are the populations that we find in, in these different uh, depth intervals. So in the water column, uh, the water is of course moving around, uh, pushed around by the wind, etc. So it's not a particularly static system. However, you have very strong gradients because of the light coming through the water column. So you have a lot of light on the surface and then it exponentially decline as you're moving uh, down into the water column. The same thing goes with the temperature. It tends to be hot near the surface and then it gets cooler as you're getting into the water column. So even on short uh, uh, scales, you can have very strong gradients uh, in the ocean water column. And what we see is that in the populations of Plocrococcus, and this is all within uh, extremely closely related types of Plocrococcus, we see that they have unique uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms as we're moving down into the water column. And so for example here from 40 to 45 meters, you basically have with, even though it's only five meters distant, you have a, com a really strong shift in the types of genotypes or the genotypes that you find in this particular environment. So this microdiversity is clearly stratified uh, within the water column. At this point we don't know what are the particular phenotypes associated with these different populations, but we can clearly see that even on these very small spatial scales, you get strong differences in the types of populations. If you also look at, uh, on a, a much uh, wider geographic scale, uh, I told you before on the cruises we did to the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, and recently we also did a cruise to the Indian Ocean, and now we're now looking at the surface populations and what we can see now is that uh, Plocrococcus populations in the Indian Ocean are quite distinct uh, from uh, the populations that we see mostly uh, in the Pacific Ocean and again distinct from the populations that we see in the Atlantic Ocean. So when you look at temperature wise and light wise and macronutrient wise, there are very, very subtle differences between uh, these environments. In the, the Atlantic Ocean, there's perhaps a little less phosphorus uh, in the water column. It might be around maybe 20 nanomolars, whereas maybe in the Pacific Ocean, it's like 60 nanomolar phosphorus and maybe 150 or so in the Indian Ocean. So these are all really, really low levels, but there are sort of subtle differences in, in the chemistry that might lead to uh, this uh, type of differentiation. 
But the point is that the populations that we find in these different ocean regions are quite distinct uh, from each other at this very fine scale level. So we have an hypothesis that at least uh, phosphorus and the differences in phosphorus might play a role in leading to these different uh, populations in, uh, in different ocean regions of Plocorococcus. So to quantify that, we went back to uh, looking at our uh, phosphorus operon over here. These are all the genes that are involved in phosphorus uptake and that tends to get upregulated under uh, P stress. And this is again in a strain of Plocorococcus, the one that's called MIT4. So uh, <coughs> using uh, metagenomes, uh, basically uh, the collection of DNA from a sample, we then try to quantify the abundance of a particular gene in Plocorococcus. So basically how many reads of this particular gene do we find in this population? And then we normalize that to uh, the mean abundance of genes that we would expect to always find in Plocorococcus. And so uh, if this ratio is one, that means that uh, approximately every cell of Plocorococcus has this particular gene in the genome. Whereas if uh, this ratio is zero, that means that uh, this gene is absent from this uh, population. And lastly, if it's uh, two or more, means that on average, the cells in this population has multiple copies of this gene. And so if we go to the Sargasso Sea, which is in the North Atlantic Ocean, we see that uh, most of the genes that are involved in phosphorus uptake is sort of within, uh, or is that a, a reasonable confidence, it's sort of close to, to the one-to-one -one line here. And so that means that the Plocorococcus population in the Sargasso Sea may, has all these different genes uh, associated with phosphorus uptake. If we go into uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there we see the same uh, thing. Also, the Plocorococcus population tends to have uh, all these genes that are involved in phosphorus acquisition. Now, if we go to the Eastern Pacific as well as the Indian Ocean, a very different uh, picture emerges. Here, uh, most of the genes that are involved in phosphorus uptake is uh, purged from the population. So the Plocorococcus population in, in uh, both the Eastern Pacific and the Indian Ocean now suddenly lacks all these different genes. Now if you remember from uh, the SNP uh, analysis I showed you before, it's also uh, unique populations that we see. It's a different population that lives in the Indian Ocean, that lives in the Pacific Ocean, that compared to uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. And we see now that this corresponds to strong differences in uh, the genome uh, content of uh, phosphorus acquisition genes. So if we now map it out on a uh, phosphorus gradient, we can see that uh, when phosphorus is really low, uh, populations with a lot of phosphorus uptake genes are the ones that dominate. Whereas if it goes above a threshold of somewhere between 25 and 50 nanomolars, uh, these genes are perched from the population, uh, at least 70% of the genes are perched from the population, and they are rare, uh, and we rarely see them. So the types that we find in the North Atlantic have one set of genome competent for phosphorus uptake, and the ones that we find in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean have a very different uh, set of genes uh, associated with uh, P uptake. And that corresponds to the fact that we see these microdiverse populations in each of the environments. So uh, to sum it up, we basically found, have proposed this sort of matrushka model for uh, the trait distribution, where we have sort of some traits that are associated with these sort of broad groupings. So for example, Plocorococcus as a whole is defined by this sort of smaller cell size. But within Plocorococcus, we have this sort of light is sort of a broad trait that sort of divides it in two. But then within the highlight types, we have separations based on iron, and then even further in, separations based on temperature. And if you go even further in, separations based on which strategies they use for uh, nutrient uptake. We also see that uh, a variable genetic marker, especially a protein encoding gene, uh, can be very effective uh, at distinguishing these very closely related types that 
still have very clear physiological uh, differentiation. And uh, we picked uh, RPUC1 because that's uh, good for our purpose, but I would really say that uh, uh, many or most protein encoding genes, uh, if you want to look at uh, closely related organisms, is much to prefer over um, a ribosomal RNA uh, type gene. Finally, we see uh, through the analysis of these single nucleotide polymorphisms that we see these clear ocean basin differences uh, related to these subtle uh, changes. Are we we think they're related to these subtle changes in nutrient acquisition uh, strategies, but I'm sure that there's more to, uh, there are more traits that we can uh, tie to that uh, as we uh, dig in deeper. With that, I'd like to thank for your attention and uh, take any questions. Yes? Um, well, you can use a lot of different uh, genes to do that. Um, we used uh, a concatenation of like all the core genes, uh, so about a thousand different genes. Um, some genes will have enough sort of variation that they resolve the tree nicely, and other genes are so close to each other or like there's not enough similarities, so the phylogenetic programs have a trouble with some of the clades that get sort of moved around. But by concatenating the genes, the, the overall phylogeny of Procorococcus really sort of emerges nicely. Yes, in the back. Well, so you're right in, in, term, in part of it, in this sort of major trait that organizes uh, the major groupings of Plocarcoccus. But there was the phosphate acquisition, which was much more variable, that we find at really, really fine levels. And there you're right that, that uh, gene gain and loss is a really key component to that. So why don't you see that with the major light adaptations? Well, so if you think of, of light as a trait, uh, the uh, photosynthetic apparatus is maybe next to the ribosome, the most complex um, molecular machinery that you see in a cell. Uh, it, just photosynthesis uh, in itself is 40 genes, but it also controls the, the energy balance of the cell um, and the redox potential of the cell. And so it's really a complex machinery to start to tinker with. Um, the same thing with, with the iron. Um, so if the iron adaptation was to gain and lose a siderophore, as we saw an example about this morning, you could easily imagine that that could be gained and lost. However, for Plocococcus to uh, adapt to a sustained low, environment, low iron environment, when, when you look at the molecular scale, what the adaptations look like, it is basically they purged uh, about 15% of all iron-containing proteins in the genome. These are all lost and substituted with uh, non-iron containing. And these are things like cytochromes uh, and also uh, various types of, of enzymes that, that uh, requires iron. And so these are complex rearrangements in, in the cellular machinery. So you can sort of imagine when you think about the complexity of fundamentally rearranging your iron proteome, so to speak, that that, that is not something you just do by gaining and losing a single gene. The last one is temperature, right? And temperature will probably affect, if not all uh, enzymes in the cell, a lot of them. And so to sort of make a, a highly competitive cell change the temperature optimum by 10 degrees, again, is probably why you're competing with everybody else, not just in the laboratory. Uh, that is probably, again, a major rearrangement. So that's why I think that those traits are the ones that occur or changes in those traits occur really rarely 
Whereas if it's a gain and loss of like a few enzymes that enables you to use you know, a new type of phosphate transporter, gaining a sidera for, or something like that. Those can be swapped in and out much more easily. And that's why you see them at the fine levels, whereas the other traits are so on and at these sort of broad levels. I don't think that's the uh, explanation because when we look at the field population, we don't really see the, like other clades. So when you uh, coming into the environments where we have sort of like these types dominating, they're like close to 100% uh, in, in terms of, of sequence reads uh, in a particular environment. So I don't think that it's undersampling of, of, of strains that they form really strong, very coherent clades with these temperature light iron. And so, so I would be skeptical to, to think that. I'm sure when it comes to the things that are very variable, that there, you know, as mu the sampling effort will determine how much variation we see. 